Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and uh, I'm joined uh, today by my uh, trusted colleagues, Ryan Sweet and uh, Chris Drees. But we all we have a, a special guest star today. This is our first guest on Inside Economics, Adam Ozemek. And Adam um, is a, a longtime colleague. Uh, he, he left. Uh, when did you leave us, Adam? How long ago was that? Two years. No way. Two years ago? 2019, yep. Really? Oh, it feels like uh, much longer than that. We, I really miss you. Uh, hey, can I ask, do you, do you miss me? Yeah, definitely. It was a lot really? of fun working at Moody's. And how many years did, you, did we work together? Uh, do you recall? Five, five years. Five years, yeah. And we had some classics. We wrote this great paper together. You, actually, you led the way on uh, productivity uh, and aging, uh, which uh, I, I view that as a classic, uh, underappreciated. That yeah, very- I, one of my favorite papers that I've ever worked on. I, I totally agree it goes underappreciated. I think that people will look back in a few years and maybe they'll get the story. Yeah, and that, that that's probably another podcast, don't you think? I think we should come back to that. Because uh, yeah. we had a lot of insight on uh, aging and productivity. And then you really helped me out on another one that it's also a classic and really helped me out a lot. It's linking uh, income and wealth inequality to ec- macroeconomic outcomes, particularly the business cycle. Do you remember that one? Yeah, I do. Yeah, for the, that um, was really, that was really good for the, the Zuckman book, right? The, the, yeah, the, that's um, exactly. Well, it was uh, Heather Boucher. Uh, yeah. It was a Paquetti uh kind of compilation of articles that she put together. Uh, yeah, that was a good one too. It was a really good one. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, I really miss you. It was great uh, to have you uh, as a colleague. But now you're the chief economist of Upwork. How's, how's that going? It's a lot of fun. I get to do um, some of the same things, you know, cover the labor market and the economy, watch what's happening. But I also get to get involved in some product decisions about this, you know, giant global labor market that we have. There's a lot of really fun data, kind of stuff you really can't get anywhere else. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and uh, Upwork's a great uh, a great company. Uh, and do you want to just describe Upwork a little bit for the folks out there that may not know? Sure. We're a global uh, freelancing platform. So it's a place where you can come to find the freelancers and a variety of skilled services to hire remotely all over the world. Um, so we help businesses and freelancers collect, uh, connect all over the world. And here's the thing about Adam that I always found amazing. He got, he has like 10 things going on at the same time. One of which is his job, but then he had like a gazillion other things going on. One of which is I recall, believe this or not, you got, you own, or maybe you still own, I'm really curious now on the other side of the pandemic, a bowling alley. Is that right? That's right. Still Still have it. We we made it through. We got uh, both rounds of PPP and uh, thanks to that, we made it through. So great. still open. And, and your people are bowling. They're coming in and bowling. and We're allowed to have the lanes half filled. So every other lane can be filled. But the, and the restaurant and the arcade are also open, but um, like with restrictions. Yeah. Is there demand? There is. There's demand. Demand is there's we're demand and supply constrained kind of at the same time. Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to find people. And, um, you know, demand isn't quite back where it is most of the time. Occasionally we'll get close to being full, but, um, and full is, you know, with, um, with quotation marks because we're, we're only allowed to have so many tables and you have to have everyone spread out. So it's definitely not back to normal yet. Hmm. Hey, that brings up uh, the topic we should discuss. You know, we begin uh, on inside economics with the data, and and then we turn to the big topic. And in this uh, week, week we're going to be talking about the work from anywhere dynamic. And I know you've done a lot of work there, so we'll come back to that. But let's uh, we we have been in the, uh, uh, talking about the data, kind of like a quiz show. We've been quizzing each other uh, and uh, trying to impress the listener with our you know prowess. Our geek, our geekness, really. You know, how how do you how in the world do you know that number, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, and uh, but th- today it feels like uh, we should just focus on that jobs number. Uh, and maybe I'll turn to Ryan because Ryan, you watch this data, the data very carefully. Maybe you could describe just from your perspective the data, and then let's talk about what's going on. Uh, you know, because it was a surprise. So uh, uh, fill us in, uh, Ryan. So just. Before I start, uh, when the number came out, I was thinking about calling in sick. 
Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. Uh, that right. was way out of you know the realm of expectation. So to put it in perspective, we created. Wait, can I ask Ryan? Was that was that before or after you got my email with a bunch of question marks? Was that before or after that? Uh, before, before, because I knew this was coming. I knew yeah. it was going to be a roast. Yeah. So exactly. I, right. I was preparing. Right. All right. All right. Far away. What, what were the numbers and what did you expect? All right. So uh, we created 266,000 jobs on net in April. Uh, the Bloomberg consensus range was from 700,000 to 2.1 million. I thought it was going to come in around 900,000. Everything pointed towards a very strong jobs number. Uh, you know, in the ISM surveys, uh, the home base data was a little bit weaker than the previous months, but it was all consistent with something close to what we got in March. So I was really taken back by, you know, the small gain in employment that we got. 266, the expectation was 900. Adam, do you, are you in, do that kind of work too? Do you actually try to uh, predict the number before it comes out? Is that something you do as well? No, I don't have to forecast anymore. It's a great, it's a great um, unburdening to not, to not have my uh, reputation on the line month after month, but uh, I do, <laughs> wa I do so watch young. it pretty closely. That's why you look so good, right? I right mean, we were exactly. just commenting, you look fantastic. Very uh, relaxed. Very relaxed, yeah. Uh, very fit. So were you surprised by the number, Adam? Um, I, so I wasn't expecting that low, but I'm not surprised to see a disappointingly no, low number. I didn't know when it was going to happen, but it's, it's been pretty obvious. I think that supply constraints are increasingly important, especially on the labor market side. And, you know, it's just, yeah, I, I think it's just simple arithmetic. When you look at the replacement rate from UI, it's like half of the people on unemployment get paid more to, to not work. You know, what do we expect that to do? And it's one thing when you have, you know, 20 million people out of work and the economy sort of frozen, but when demands are covering and also job openings are basically back to normal, you combine that with that kind of, um, um, uh, you know, UI, you're going to get a serious constraint on supply. And so I think that's exactly what we're seeing. Hey, Brian, you think the same thing. You at least that's I agree with Adam. Yep. But Is I would also add on, I mean, I think something more than that. Well, I mean, from month to month, the employment numbers can do crazy things. So you don't want to try to explain the unexplainable sometimes. But yeah. I do think we'll get more clarity over the next few months that labor supply issues are going to be more binding. And that's why I think risk to our employment forecast for the next few months is you know, weighted to the downside. We might be a little bit too optimistic. Because in addition to the UI uh, argument that Adam makes, and which I agree with, uh, there's child care problems. Uh, you know, that's not going to get resolved until the the next school year because summer camps, things like that aren't going to be fully open. So if you look at the female labor force participation rate, it hasn't budged and it's well below that scene pre pandemic. And uh, Dante did a lot of great work looking at using the uh, BLS micro data to look at employment. By, Dante, Dante's one of our other colleagues, Dante. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, parents He's Adam for, like, he's actually Adam like, uh, Adam, have you met Dante? Do you know? Yeah, Dante? Dante's great. Dante worked on the productivity yeah. paper with us. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, Dante is very Adam-like. But uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Ryan. Oh, no, uh, so he uh, was look, uh, looking at employment among uh, parents, and that's still very, very low relative to pre-pandemic. So I think the labor supply issue isn't going to go away anytime soon. But the good news is it is temporary because the UI benefits are going to expire in September. Hopefully the next school year, everything's up and running. So, you know, the job growth that we didn't get in April, we're going to get over the next you know, six, nine months. Got it. Hey, well, here's what I don't understand about that argument, though. I mean, if you look at the weakness in the report, it wasn't in the sectors you would thought that would be affected by labor supply constraints or UI. Like restaurants added, I don't know, how many did they, they added like 260,000 mm -hmm. jobs or something like that. So are you saying that they would have added even more than that? Is that what yeah. you're saying? I was expecting a big Legion of Hospitality gain. And also if, uh, the supply issue is also visible in hours worked. If you look at the average work week for leisure and hospitality, I think off the top, I think it was 26.7 hours, which is higher than we've ever seen uh, with the data going back to 2006, 2007. Yeah, you yeah. can see it in the wage data too. The, the wages in leisure and hospitality are now like 5% above pre-pandemic levels and they're moving up really quickly too. Yeah. I mean, I saw when I looked at it, I saw a weakness in construction that there was no jobs. 
that makes that's not labor supply. I, I don't. Maybe there is. Maybe who knows? But the, the real weakness there, you don't go from forty, fifty thousand a month to zero because of labor supply constraints. You know, temp help fell one hundred and fifteen thousand after growing consistently before that. That you just go go from plus to minus one fifteen. Vehicle manufacturing fell. Now that that that's not labor supply. That's probably chip you know related issues. Uh, educational services. I mean, I don't know. I look at the the couriers. Couriers fell. That's you know UPS and and FedEx. That that fell big time. So, uh, employment at food and beverage stores. That fell like fifty, sixty thousand. That that doesn't feel. It's not like we fell off a cliff or something with regard to the labor supplies. It just doesn't feel right to me. It just doesn't feel. How, right. that, can I throw another theory out, and you guys can agree or disagree? Yeah. Do you think labor market churn is really picking up? Meaning that you know. People are quitting jobs to take jobs where they can get signing bonuses and things like that. I mean, you hear some big chain restaurants are offering hiring bonuses now. So maybe yeah, I quit, think quit rates are going up. And, and they are up. I mean, quit, rate, quit, quit rates are high. And I think you really have to think of this as sort of a bigger labor market than just limited to one uh, industry. We're really talking about you know something that encompasses the relatively low skilled labor market. And I think that you have a lot of, you know, back and forth between, you know, warehouse jobs, uh, temp, temp services and the leisure and hospitality sector. And they're all sort of competing for, you know, relatively unskilled labor. And so you can have, you know, you see wages and hours go up in leisure and hospitality, but you see employment go up as well. And that can be them, like Ryan said, you've got these high signing bonuses. That can be them pulling um, workers out of other sectors. But overall, you just got this like tightness there. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I hear you. It just it feels like there's a lot of sectors where it almost fell off of a cliff, you know, big declines. It just doesn't, consistent with the idea that there's these tightening labor constraints developing throughout the economy. The other thing is ADP, you know, we, we help uh, ADP, the, the human resource company, put their data together. We, I, I tell you, I didn't sense, we, we can't, I think we had private sector payroll up, I can't remember, it was 750,000 during the month, something like that. And I, the underlying data looked really strong to me. I, I could not s see any, you know, uh, real weakness uh, in the employment data. And I would have thought I would have seen it there if there were labor supply constraints. Now, admittedly, ADP doesn't capture small businesses quite as well. Uh, but even, you know, even in the restaurant, at least the hospitality industry, it felt, felt okay. So I, I'm just surprised by it. I think it's, here's my gut, and it's just a gut feeling that we're going to get it right back on track next month. Uh, you know, we're going to get some big numbers next month that this was a, it's like BLS always throws a curve, a uh, curve ball, you know, a pretty big curve ball. One, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I think it was uh, August of 2010, you know, coming out of the financial crisis and it felt like the economy was kind of gaining traction and things were going in the right direction. And everyone was sitting there thinking we get a big employment number. It came out to be a big fat zero. Do you remember that? Do you guys remember? That? Yeah, we were we were pretty close on that one. Yeah, we were pretty close. It was a, a lot of te technical issues, but it's always weak in August. It right. always comes in below the consensus in August. But if this number feels like that, that kind of a data point, it's like you know, just the data coming together in a way that. Do you think it's uh, seasonal factors? Or? Well, who knows? It's a survey. There's all kinds of issues. Just There's a lot of churn in the labor market, as Ryan said. You know, particularly in coming out of the recession. So and very what, difficult I, to measure. I don't right. think there's one factor. I think there's a lot of things going on. I mean, there yeah. were there was another reason this is a big surprise is that there was five weeks between reference periods. And usually that biases the employment right. number up. So I don't know if like, you know, because of the pandemic and all the adjustments to the seasonal adjustment process, yeah. if things are just off kilter. The, the other thing is those seasonal adjustment factors and the sort of, you know, the stuff that'll get, um, you know, uh, revised away they might uh, push the headline up higher or they might resolve all these mysteries you're talking about, Mark. I mean, like obviously month to month, there's a lot of uh, noise there, but you get even more noise when you go down to sectoral level. So it, it may be the case that the mystery, or that the revisions totally clean up all the mysteries next month when it turns out leisure hospitality didn't add that much and some of these other sectors are revised up. Yeah, okay. Well, um, this is why economists are employed, I guess, so we can sit here and discuss and debate all these things. Let me ask you this, though, Adam. Ryan uh, made a, a strong statement, I thought, and he said, look, 
uh, yeah, there's labor supply constraints, but this will all be resolved over the next, say, six months because schools will go back in person. Uh, uh, moms and dads that have been home can go back to work. Uh, the UI, supplemental UI falls off uh, in September. So, w w you know, uh, yeah, we may not get as many jobs created because of the supply constraints in the next few months, but we'll get those jobs in a year from now you know, we'll be, you know, uh, recovering most of the jobs we lost in the pandemic and getting back closer to full employment. Do you concur with that perspective, that view? I think, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of, I was worried about a lot of permanent damage from this, but I don't see a lot of permanent damage. I mean, household balance sheets are in incredible shape. Uh, business failures were elevated, but nowhere near, you know, what you would have expected given the size of the shutdown. It's really more like, you know, I think it's like probably like on average, like one and a half times normal, not like five, six, seven or eight times normal. So, you know, obviously you're going to need firm formation to make up for that. But then on the other hand, you also have really great firm formation data. So I think I think we really did avoid the really bad kind of damage that could have been done had we not thrown trillions of dollars at the economy. So I do think that we will we will recover from this and um, get back on the path we were on uh, headed towards full employment. Yeah. One totally. thing I'll add is hearing Adam talk about labor shortages and you know buying into it is stark contrast to uh, his view uh, throughout the last expansion when everyone was saying that uh, we're running up to labor supply constraints and that never came to fruition. So, you know, I, I think Adam's making a strong argument. Well, can I say I also, uh, but on the flip side of it, you know, I, when when Adam was saying that that uh, that there were, were no labor supply constraints. I was saying there was, and now you'll notice he's saying there's labor supply constraints. And I'm saying don't worry about it. So we're we're on the flip of that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, let me ask you: uh, Do you land in this roughly the same place as as the rest of us in terms of this is temporary, and you know a year from now we'll, the economy will have gotten these jobs and uh, we'll be approaching full employment? Yeah, I think it's just a yeah. a strange yeah. time, right? We have both supply yep. and demand issues <laughs> uh, simultaneously. But yeah, I, I think by September, uh, things will have largely worked themselves out. Okay, so I wanna go on to the big topic. Before I do that, I wanna have one quiz and I'm, we're gonna see who gets, this isn't a, this isn't a toughie. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. So Ryan, you're not allowed to answer because uh, you, you will probably know this. Uh, this is a quiz for Chris and Adam. Tell me what this number is, 18.5 million. 18.5 million. You got oh, this is an seconds. underhanded softball for Adam. <laughs> Can I guess? Is that yeah, continuing ahead. claims? No, no, but I'm trying okay. to think. Could it be close to? Con I don't think, I think that's, I don't know. That's not right. No. Do you know, Chris? And then I'm going to flip it to uh, Ryan. This to me is the most telling statistic of the month. Ding, 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 ding. Nope, Ryan, not, what is it? Not Vehicle coming. sales. Yeah, new vehicle oh, sales, 18.5 million in the month of April. That was the biggest sales April sales month on record. How many, there can't be too many months in history where we got over 18 and a half million units, right? Ryan, it's gotta be just a handful. I'm trying to think maybe back to cash for clunkers, but that was like a one. Yeah, maybe, one month uh, wonder. Yeah, yeah I don't, I, no, 18 and a half is really strong. Yeah, eight. so to me, that says it all. That is an economy that is, Booming. It's booming. And not consistent with uh, job loss, uh, but uh, at least not consistent job loss. So we'll see how that goes. How about I give you a number that's a segue into the, the big topic? Okay. Let me see if the three of you can get it. Okay. 18.3%. I know what that is. Should I say it? Go ahead. Do you guys know? Go for it. Adam knows. You guys don't know? Okay. That is, according to BLS, in the month of April, the percent of the workforce that's working remotely, right? Exactly. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you see, Ryan thinks he can school me. You think he still, to this day, thinks he can school me on, on these statistics. Yeah. You guys no, when I get you, you, you complain. Like, it's a, oh, it's a, you know, uh, a number that no one pays attention to. Oh, that's true. I do do that. You guys are the masters of holding numbers in your head. I remember being very impressed at this when I came to Moody's, how many numbers you guys hold in your heads at the same really? time. Yeah, I know Ryan can do it because because he, he loves baseball so much. It's kind of the same thing. I don't I don't know where your your ability to do this comes from, Mark. 
Well, I, I can remember nothing else. That's it. I mean, I can barely <laughs> remember my passcode. I mean, I'm like, I'm deathly afraid I'm going to forget my passcode. So I write it. Well, I shouldn't be telling everybody this, but I write it down. Where do you write? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That, that's, the, that's my trick. It's the only thing I can remember. Okay. Anyway, well, that's a good segue. Hey, so set the table, Ryan. I, what, are the, what does BLS say about remote work, the percent of the workforce? And let's see if that lines up with kind of Adam's survey work. So, so what are the numbers, roughly speaking, before the pandemic, during- Well, they weren't doing the survey before the pandemic. It's only post-pandemic. So in the last, uh, so in March, 21% of people were working uh, remotely or at home because of the pandemic. And that dropped to 18.3%. Uh, in uh, April. And what was it at the peak? I think back in March, April last year, because they started it back then, I believe, the BLS. I, I mean, ballpark, I, off the top of my head, this is one number I, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, I think it was 27, or it was north of 30, I think. I thought it was north of 30. I, thought it was I think it's north of 30. Of yep. Like April of last I was using year. a third, yeah. That's yeah, like yeah. a third. Yeah, like a third. Adam, is that consistent with your the way you would characterize it and, and, and what, what, what do you think work from anywhere? What remote work percent was uh, working from remotely before the pandemic? Do you have a sense of that? So um, before the pandemic, there's a little, there's, un, there's uncertainty about this because it really, it depends on how you ask the question and workers are pretty sensitive to like kind of the details of how you ask the question to start. You also often see a conflict between people who are saying work from home versus work remotely which are two distinct things, right? Like if you ask someone to work from home, that's a subset of work remotely. Um, and then work remotely is really just kind of, there's like a, a, a line that's a little bit confusing where you draw it. So let me give you an example. If you have an office in your basement, like that's clearly working remotely, right? Yeah. Um, if you have an office downtown though, but you're the only one who works there and all your clients are at a different location, is that remotely? Mm. Oh, good point. Right. Right. But then if you add a couple more workers to the office, then it doesn't seem remotely anymore. Right. 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 So like it's, there's like a gray line. So that creates a lot of uncertainty about um, how many were working pre and um, also during um, the BLS number has an added complication that they, they ask um, in the last four weeks, were you working remotely because of the pandemic? So right. if you were working remotely pre-pandemic, then you, um, you wouldn't respond that you were, like you wouldn't show up in the data. Right, right. So, so if I asked you to characterize work from home, however you want to define it, or work remotely uh, before the pandemic, in the teeth of the pandemic, and like right now, what would you say? How would you characterize it? So I think... Pre-pandemic, we were probably somewhere between five to nine percent, like depending yeah. on where you draw the line. And it's also really important whether you're talking about wage and salary workers versus self-employed, because the self-employed have like a way, way higher share of work from home or work remote. At the peak of the pandemic, I think it was probably like 60 percent. Oh, you do. You um, it was a really high number. Yeah. yeah. And that's consistent with Gallup, too. Gallup finds a much higher number than the BLS does. Today, I think we're probably down around like, you know, maybe 25, 30%, something like that. Mm -hmm. And you have, then you have a lot of people who are working part time as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe 25, 30% full time, maybe, you know, 15% part time. So like 40% to some degree or another. That's about where I think it is. And I think in the long run, we're going to end up at around probably like 20% full time and maybe another. 10 to 15 percent part-time but there's there's a lot of uncertainty obviously about that so like i think a, a third of workers working remotely to some extent okay so just so just to summarize that just make sure i got it right pre-pandemic five to ten percent teeth of the pandemic as high as 60 percent and now we're probably down around 25 30 but we're going to settle in about ultimately you know when it's all said and done a few years down the road about a third of the workforce will be working remotely. That's kind of the way you're thinking about this. Yeah, that the third would include like the, all the part-time. All the part-timers. Workers. So like 20% yeah. full-time and like a third, including all the part-timers. Yeah, does so that that's... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was going to ask, does that include the hybrid? 
uh, work. Yeah, the, the, that that would be included in the um, in the part timers. Yeah, got it. So four you... four days in the office, one day at home. That's still a remote. Okay. Yeah, you you've run a couple surveys of hiring managers. Uh, I'm I'm sure that you do business with it at Upworks, and there was one question that you you were asking the respondents what surprised you most positively su surprised you the most about uh, working from home or working remotely, and the number one response was uh, eliminating unessential meetings. That does not resonate with me at all. I feel like I'm on Zoom 100% of the day, all the time. It, it, what, how, did, how do you, it, am I the only one thinking? What about you, Chris? Brian, do you, how do you feel about that? I, it's just one big meeting. It's, it's just one <laughs> big meeting. It's just one big meeting. It just continues. I, it, does that, did that surprise you, Adam, that you got that answer in the survey? That, that was the number one thing they learned or that they uh, found uh, uh, positively surprised at coming out of this? Well, two things about that. One, it is relative to expectations, right? Okay. So maybe they, you know, thought it was going to go really, really bad and it went just a little bad. But uh, it also, if you just ask in absolute terms, like are you doing more meetings or less? Uh, it, it depends from survey to survey. Um, whether, you know, if you ask the workers, if you ask the managers, but, um, it seems to me on that, that you, I mean, you hear a lot about the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease or whatever. So you hear a lot of stories about too many meetings, but I, I think that there's, there's a lot of people who are like, they find that they have more control over their day. You know, you can't, you can't mm. pop into someone's office in their basement and you can't like, just go knock on their cubicle and just walk up and ask him to do something and maybe this is um maybe this is like a, a manager worker difference or something like that mm -hmm. um in perceptions because uh you know if it, there weren't a lot of people who would just like pop into your office would be mm -hmm. my recollection mark you had you need a meeting with mark zandy if you want to if you want to grab maybe. mark zandy's time um yeah. but me in my in my cubicle i would have people popping in all the time come to the knock on the wall and say, Hey, have you looked at, or can you do this or that? And so you just, you know, it, you have, you have meet, you definitely have meetings, but like you, you know, when they are, you know, where they are and you have control over that. Yeah. I, I totally get the, the, the other thing that people said that possibly surprised them is the flexibility they had uh, in their day. And that I totally get, but what I've had to do in my calendar is I have to actually block out the time because if I don't block out the time, literally I will have no time to my, I mean, no, no time. I can't even use the bathroom. That's the, how, how, how difficult it is, you know? So, uh, I don't know, Chris, you and Ryan, you, oh, you feel the same way. I thought it was just me. So it's good to hear that. Okay. Good to me. hear. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Ryan? The one nice thing about zoom meetings is you can keep working cause you can just turn off your camera. You so you're there, see. but you can right. get work done. <laughs> right. right. Hey, so Adam, in all the surveys that you did, what surprised you most? Uh, what was the result you got that said, "Oh, wow! I, I that that I didn't know that about that. I didn't I didn't think that was going to happen." The in in the one we did, we asked whether it was going better or worse than expected, and it it, it was really much more roundly better than I thought because it, you you throw so many people into this way of working that there's a lot you have to learn about how to work this way. Like blocking off your calendar is one example. Mark. So like the company that I work at now, Upwork is a, is a remote company. So I've always had to like be remote here. And that was one of the things that you learn is like, you gotta, you gotta watch your calendar. You gotta be a little defensive of your calendar. And like, you, if you need, like, if you've got big projects that you really need to be heads down on, you should, you should block that time off. Mm -hmm. And that stuff takes like time to learn. There's like practice to this. And th those are like the immediate sort of adjustments. There's also like, you know, adjustments reorienting your entire firm around this way of work. So if you think about like in the industrial revolution, when they first created, you know, electrified engines versus the, like the giant turbines it used to be the case that in a factory, you'd have like one giant turbine that turned. And it was like huge engine, the middle of the factory and everything sort of worked off that electrification allowed for the creation of smaller engines, but those didn't really have effects on those old factories because you can't, you can't just like bring these new engines in and you keep the big factory 
with a factory oriented around one like giant mechanical engine and just pile all the little electrical ones on. You need to build new factories. You need to start from scratch. And I think that there is a lot about remote work that remote first startups are going to get and they're going to build a culture around and they're going to build management practices around. And the rest of us sort of have to learn those things. So it was it was surprising to me how how people were saying, like, it's going better than I thought so early. I sort of expected it was going to go like not that great at first. And then over time, people would get better at it. But like the the really positive response immediately surprised me. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll have to say I'm I'm very positively predisposed to all things. I was skeptical in the beginning. In fact, I can remember in the pandemic that the start of the pandemic, we were lucky at Moody's because we adopted Zoom. Like, I don't know, it felt like two weeks before the pandemic hit, just fortuitously. So we had Zoom. And then when the pandemic hit, people started doing the Zoom thing. And I go, what the heck is that? I'm not doing that. I'm going to, no, I still want to do the conference call. Now I can't even tell you what the number for the conference call is. I mean, I (laughs) can't do it. And I go, uh, what is this? What are we? What are we doing? How is this going to work? And immediately, though, within about I'd say thirty minutes, I go, "Oh, this is a game changer. This is this is this is real, and I, I this really works. You know, this really is much easier." And you know, people. One of the things I that I'll just give you a personal example that I find so amazing is we have a, a lot of people that we hire. Right? We've got a couple hundred economists around the world, and people we could hire people. They could be with us for five years, and I may not have ever talked to them. Literally, never have talked to them because they're sitting in Prague, they're sitting in, you know, Singapore, Dubai, London, wherever, and I never had a chance. But now, every new employee that comes, I make uh, an effort to sit down with that person through Zoom for thirty minutes, and I immediately have a relationship with them, and it makes all the difference because now I go into meetings and I have a relationship and we, it just makes the whole conversation all that much easier, which before there, you know, I didn't know who that person was. It's just, just an amazing thing. And I'm sure there's many, many examples of that kind of uh, benefit from Zoom. It's really fascinating to hear that from, from you guys, because Moody's is such a highly already globalized company. Like pre pandemic, you would have been like, well, here's an example of a company that clearly knows how to work like with remote workers all over the world. It, yeah. But to hear that, like the change has also pushed you guys further along the technological frontier is really interesting. It just goes to show that, like, you know, there was there was room for improvement all the way from like people who did zero remoteness and were just like a tiny isolated, like you know, they they're all in one office all the time, to like even you know mega global corporations that are already over the world. That's a, a, a potential to improve productivity there. So, so what's wrong with it? I mean, you got folks out there, you know, prominent folks. I think. Jamie Dimon, CEO of uh, JP Morgan, might be the most outspoken, but I'm sure there are others that say this isn't this isn't such a great idea. My pro- the productivity of my workforce is declining, and I can actually see it on a Friday. It's definitely lower than it is in the rest of the work. Going back to you have more flexibility, so people take Friday uh, half off, let's say, and no one knows uh, no one's the wiser for it. What, what do you think of those arguments, and and uh, uh, you know how do you think about that? What's the downside to all this? So it's important to benchmark. And, you know, I'm saying that long run, we'll have 20% full-time remote, which means 80% will be not full-time remote. And so I think a lot of what we see is companies that it's just not a good fit for them. You know, when it might be a result of their industry. It might be a result of their management style. Um, it literally might be just a result of the CEO, but for some companies, it's not a great fit, but they're kind of stuck there because of the pandemic. And that's what that's what makes the productivity effects here interesting, because in both my work and in um, Nick Bloom of Stanford, he has work on this as well. He finds positive productivity effects. I find positive productivity effects. And we're finding this based on all these companies that were just thrown into this experiment overnight against their will. And a lot of them who aren't going to be remote in the long run. So like once this, you know, we're waiting for the selection effects to take hold where companies for whom this is a good fit. They stay in it. Companies who it's not a good fit, they they leave it, and then like everybody's happier. It, it's sort of like it's a really unfair test of productivity in a lot of ways. Think about like if before R was invented, the statistical software, if you forced everyone, every state of user in the world to adopt R for a year, and then you measure the productivity effects, mm. that wouldn't be a very good test of the invention of R and letting people self-select into R, right? 
because right. like people for whom it's not a good fit, they're going to have to do anyway and their productivity is going to go down. So, you know, the Jamie diamonds of the world, let themselves select out. And, you know, maybe that, that maybe that's the equilibrium. Um, but then again, maybe they're going to come up against the startup in the same industry who manages to make remote work. And then they're just going to get their lunch eaten. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me ask you, I mean, this might be a little geeky, but I'm, I'm really curious. How do you, 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 your work and Bloom's work, how do you measure productivity? Uh, and uh, 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 I had another question, but how do you, how do you measure productivity? So in our work, both of us were just relying on self-reported productivity from managers, importantly, because obviously you ask workers, they're going to be hesitant to tell you their productivity went down. So mm -hmm. it's really the managers who are asking it up. But there's more rigorous measurement of the effects of remote work on productivity from pre-pandemic times and also some that sort of uh, straddled the pre and post-pandemic period. And those are generally um, like call center workers. Uh, and then there's another study on patent officers. And I think one of the other one was like travel agents, something like that. So like you have these occupations where you can measure outcomes. And in those um, studies, they've all found that productivity does go up from remote work. So it'd be hard to make those sorts of uh, productivity-based measurements across a lot of different kinds of companies and industries without making it sort of subjective. Um, so like you have that, the subjective, and then you have like the very well-defined, well-measured, but it's like more limited to individual uh, occupations and industries. So like less uh, external validity there. Got it. Hey, let me ask you. So you think it lifts productivity growth. Uh, do you think it's also all else being equal deflationary? Does it reduce, put downward pressure on costs and inflation? Yeah, I would say so through, through if nothing else, the housing market channel, and but also the labor market channel too. I mean, you're going to, yeah. I think that the two, look at the two biggest housing markets that got hit by the pandemic and yeah. have been seeing the prices go down in San Francisco and New York City. And so, you know, I, I see it as sort of leaning against uh, the trend of the last few decades where skilled service workers have just increasingly clustered into a handful of superstar cities. And those cities, by the way, don't build new houses. So like prices have just gone up, up, up and, you know, wages go up, up, up with them. And I do think that that, that there is a, a geographic contribution to um, inflation that way. Yeah. Before you move on to the labor market channel, let me ask Chris, because Chris, you know, focuses quite a bit on housing markets. I, I mean, how big a deal do you think work from anywhere has been in the, the hot housing market? I mean, the housing market, single family housing market's uh, booming, it's raging, price gains are strong. How much of that is work from anywhere, Chris? I, certainly a uh, significant share. I don't know what the what fraction you'd give it, but uh, clearly, right, the movement has been to the suburbs looking for more space, for a more comfortable work environment at home, right? So that's certainly been a driver of a lot of the activity. Right. Uh, longer term, I, well, I guess if we're saying this is going to wear off to some degree, right, then the reverse would happen, right? We'd expect to see some deceleration going forward. You mean in the in the uh, in the prices. future when when the the pandemic is over, work from anywhere moderates a little bit before we start before it starts increasing again. You're saying, yeah, that's right. So if uh, yeah. if we are going back to the office, right, that's going to change my yep. calculus in terms of the size of the house I want, where I want it located, right? Right. City becomes more attractive once again, perhaps for some segment of the population. Right. Right. Hey, on the labor market channel here, I got a, a another kind of, I, you know, I've tried to, for me, it always, it's all personal. So in, in thinking about it from a Moody's context, the, the work from anywhere dynamic is empowering. You know, it allows people to go and live where they want to live. Uh, and, you know, uh, and um, uh, that's good for them. That's good for us, you know, as employers, but we're having trouble with pay. So, you know, let's say I'm in, I live in New York just to make it a, a, a striking contrast and I get New York wages. And then I say, hey, uh, Mark, I want to go live in Tampa, Florida. I want to go live there because the cost of living is lower. Housing is more affordable. My commutes are lower. Taxes are lower. Should I get paid New York wages or should I get paid Tampa wages? And how do, how do employers figure that out? I mean, do you have a sense of that? Uh, and I guess that goes to your point about the deflationary aspects of 
uh, of this on uh, through the labor market channel? Yeah, I, that's a great question. It's a very fascinating question as to whether we're going to end up with something more like a, um, uh, a national U.S. labor market where you sort of have like, here's the wage for this occupation, no matter where you live. I think it kind of depends on how big this labor market, the remote labor market gets, whether we end up with something that looks more like that. Um, like right now, I think it's really a matter of sort of individual bargaining power to a, to a large degree. Um, it, we, we, we can look at this a little bit in our data actually at Upwork. So we know where every client's located. We know where every freelancer is located. And so we can look at, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of contracts and see does the labor market uh, we can also match every contract to the kind of job that it is. You can compare it to BLS data on pay in that industry uh, or in that occupation uh, in those actual physical labor markets. So what I did in a, in a recent paper is I looked at contracts when you have a, a client in a high cost of living city and a freelancer in a low cost of living city. And what are, are, are both either or neither of the labor markets, do they affect the, the actual um, hourly pay that gets negotiated and they do both have an impact so they do yeah. both 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 labor markets tend to pull tend to pull on that um so that's a possibility but then you know there's there's other evidence from our platform that's that some of these um some occupations the wages are really like this is the wage you make this everywhere and that's like the end of the story right. so uh, i think it, it i think it depends on on maybe on liquidity in the particular uh, occupation the extent that it goes remote so that you know, is someone's outside option another remote company or is their outside option a local labor market company? To the extent right. that it's dominated by local labor markets, then I think you will see some some cost of living. I think, you know, you have this, you have a big chunk of, you know, economic rents basically to split when you match between a high cost and a low cost place. And so like, how do you share that surplus? I think um, in, it, for now it will tend to be in the middle. In the long run, it depends. Yeah, and in my mind, that's why it's going to take a little bit of time to get up to that one third share of the workforce that is remote, because employers like Moody's are going to have to try to figure that one out. How do we how do we navigate that one? Uh, we want to do it. It seems like it's in the best interest of everybody, but how do you get from here to there? You know, given you know the wage structures that exist. So right, it's a little weird because you like on the one hand. As economists, we think, well, this is what this, the marginal productivity of that worker is. So, like, yeah, exactly. Paid, right. No. But on the other hand, like, is that what they should be paid, or should they be paid the going rate in the labor market? Because, like, that's what the, the rate that the market sets. It's sort of a there's a tension there. Although I like the way you're thinking about it, I'm around occupations because it is really going to marginal product, right? I mean, I don't care whether you do it in Tampa or Boise or San Francisco or New York, I mean, it, you're, you're, you're doing a certain thing. There is a market for that and you have a certain level of productivity, at least value added relative to, to the company, you know, what you're producing. So that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's probably where we migrate over time. Yeah, yeah. And I think it really depends on whether there's someone else for whom they can earn that same marginal productivity where if you don't pay it, then they'll take it, right? Because right. if, you're, if the marginal productivity in that labor market is lower, like which is what generates the low cost there, then they don't really have that bargaining power to demand that. And of course, we're now talking about a global market now too, right? Yeah. Increasingly, right? So yeah. yeah, you're one step away then from uh, competing with Mumbai, right? Then Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Very, very interesting. Hey, so I'm going to uh, throw this to Chris and Ryan uh, uh, and then uh, back to you, Adam. There's certainly going to be some, re we've already alluded to this, but there's going to be some regional in the, within the U.S. economic impacts. Are, are there any, you know, I think there's the obvious one, or maybe it's not so obvious, around big urban areas being diminished and kind of suburbs, exurbs, smaller cities uh, uh, benefiting. Is there is there any other regional aspects to this that we should be thinking about? Like, you know, I, I worry about my hometown's, our hometown's Philly, right? The Philadelphia area. I worry about uh, the, the, uh, the city of Philadelphia because they have a wage tax. You know, how is that going to, play in a world of work from anywhere, you know, uh, that becomes pretty difficult. So do you guys, have you thought about that or anybody, any, any thoughts on the regional impacts of this? Well, anecdotally to support your, your argument about Philly's wage, wage tax, the housing market right around our office in Westchester is on fire. And a lot of the realtors, like when we sold our house, a lot of the interest was from Philadelphia residents. Mm. Is that right? 
Okay. So it's already so, happening. Philadelphia is an interesting case. Um, so, like, I think that there's obvious places that will lose and obvious places that will win. And then there's yeah. a lot of places that are kind of in between. Exactly. Philadelphia is kind of a place that's in between. I actually yeah. think like the, the bad history that Philadelphia has had with regional competition has kind of already puts them in a stronger position. Cause like the cat's already out of the bag. Like for, you know, Philadelphia has had decades of people leaving the city to, to live in the suburbs, right. Mm-hmm. And to work in the suburbs to the extent that Philly suburbs has basically just as many jobs as Philadelphia has, which is quite different from the normal center city suburb dynamic. Normally the center of the city is where the jobs are. And then the suburbs, you don't have the jobs there. And so like, you don't have the, the, the city has this sort of monopoly power. It's an extracted rent. It keeps prices high in the center of the city relative to the suburbs. And in general, you have a line that declines from the center of the city. And the farther out you go, the farther down it goes. Philadelphia is not like that. Philadelphia has a, a spike in the middle where the center city is expensive, but then the price goes down and then it goes back up again once you get to the suburbs because the suburbs actually have quite a few jobs there. And so what we're seeing in Philadelphia is Center City and South Philly are taking a hit because, right, that's the core. Those are the nice parts of the city. And like they had that like that high price that was like in part based on access to jobs. The suburbs, other than, you know, there's a couple of places, Westchester, I guess, would be one example. Other than a couple of places, the suburbs as a whole aren't doing that great. And where, where you're actually seeing the strong growth is North Philly and West Philly. And I think that that's because like those are the low cost of living places in the area. Those are the places where previously like you didn't have really great access to, to jobs and it's still relatively low cost of living. So you go to New York City, San Francisco, the places that are benefiting are like exurbs because that's where the lower cost of living is. But in Philly, the lower cost of living is still within the city boundary. Yeah, I, I think this is a very complex issue and it's city to city. Really, I mean, because you got to think about who the competition is and the cost structures, and you know, there's like the other thing about Philly is you're, you know, on on the Acela, you're an hour and fifteen to New York, an hour and a half to DC. With this, you you could work three days. You could live in Philly cheaply, do three days there, and maybe go up one day a week into New York or go one one day a week into DC. So it might actually work out in Philly's favor, you know. Uh, yeah. That kind of- on the other hand, if you work in Philadelphia for two days a week, you can take the Amtrak line out to the sort of cheaper, when you go even further out than the Philly suburbs, yeah, yeah. go out to, uh, you know, Lancaster, Harrisburg, Dolphin County, where prices are way lower than even in the suburbs. And so like Philly gets it both ways. Like they'll probably get some remote commuters living there and they'll probably get some remote commuters leaving there. Yeah. Hey, you know, this reminds me, I, this is why I miss you so much. I really miss you, Adam. If you ever want to come back, I, I, you know, you're, you're more than welcome. I mean, these are the kind of, I, I get these conversations with Ryan and, and Chris, but I need, I need more of it. So, you know, please, you know, feel free to come back anytime. Hey, what are we missing here? What didn't we discuss about Work From Anywhere that we should be uh, uh, talking about that we missed? Anything in particular? There's a lot of moving parts here, I know, and there's a lot of script to be written but is there one, one or two things you think we should be thinking about that we're not thinking about on this issue? So I think that a really important aspect is the impact on, on dynamism and startups and entrepreneurship. Um, because we already did see this year, I don't know if you guys have been following the, um, the business formation statistics at all. Have you seen this? Like the BEIN the numbers? Data? You mean the BEIN data? Or, yep. Yeah. They're, like, they're the incredible, roof. right? Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I think one of the things oh, that's EIN, happening- by the way, for the listener, sorry, the, the EIN is uh, when you start a company, there's a tax, uh, what's the EIN is the acronym is uh, identification, establishment identification number, I think. So I go start a company, I got to get an EIN for tax purposes, and the government records that. And so they have a grip on how many businesses are forming. So that, that's what EIN is. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's good context. Yeah. So the Census Bureau collects those business registrations and then they break them out by like industry and they break them out by whether it's a likely employee establishment or not a likely employee establishment because when you fill out your EIN form, you say whether you're going to have employees or not. And a lot of the growth is in the non-employee establishments. And so you also have that you have it in retail and you have professional services. You've seen a really huge spike in it. So non-employee retail and professional services. What do you guys think these people are? I thought they were more like uh, 
software companies and uh, no workers though pardon me not employee though oh non employee oh yeah what I, I thought real estate maybe because there's a lot of real estate transactions so every time you you know you uh, uh, you know I'm a, I know this because my son does it. he goes by his uh, uh, old homes in the middle, row homes in Philly, and immediately sets up an LLC and he needs an EIN, you know, for the LLC. So I thought that might be part of it, but you, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something. Go ahead. Yeah. So they give you the NAICS code. So you can oh, see they do. That there, okay. there is yeah. some there. Yeah. So, but you, there's a huge jump in retail and in professional services. And I uh, think what's happening is that you have a lot of people who are working online. Um, that you've got people who have decided to, you can also see it in the platform data. So, um, you know, this has been a really, really strong year for Upwork. We had like, you know, some of the fastest growth in a really long time. Um, and uh, who else? Like Etsy and eBay. And so I think that what's happening is remote works unlocking a lot of like um, entrepreneurship, a lot of startups. Um, and, and, you know, for a lot of independent people who are just they're they've decided they're, you know, a programmer or web developer or whatever. And they want to just do, they want to do freelance. So you get, you get the remote life, right. Gives you a little bit of flexibility. And then once you go independent, you get even more flexibility. And so just watching the, the strong demand on our platform, both client and freelancer side and seeing these business formation statistics, I really think that that's, and they're still high. Like these numbers are all still really high. Like even as the pandemic is like winding down, so I think that that is a structural increase there. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you you ascribe this a surge in uh, EIN numbers and formations to perhaps to uh, work from anywhere. Yeah, very yep. interesting. Hey, I did want to throw out one. My wife, I you know, I'm, I was chatting with my wife about uh, work from anywhere, and she constantly point, and I keep like you espousing the benefits of this. I mean, I'm always surprised by new things that. Among, that I'm that I'm doing that are empowered by the by the work from anywhere, and she does point out that young people this is a problem for them that you know they use the workplace as you know a place to meet people it makes sense right you know and that's I I didn't meet my wife in the workplace but I know a lot of people who have uh, and so w- what do you say about that I mean it's just that a matter of adaptation and we'll figure that one out or do you think that's a real impediment to work from anywhere. Uh, I think it depends on the occupation. I think there are some occupations where you probably need that person to person, like mentoring and like, uh, you know, hands on sort of learning um, and, um, you know, something like, I don't know, maybe sales or something like that, you know, and um, uh, very hands on occupations, things like that. So I do think that there are some occupations where you're going to you're, they're going to go back to the office because that like sort of person to person connection matters. On the socialization side, I think that, you know, before the pandemic, you would hear people talking about how professionals have become like overworked and they've wrapped up their identities too much in work. And we live in this like work obsessed life. And obviously it's like a bimodal distribution, right? Where you're concerned that like, you know, people without a lot of education aren't working enough. But then we say that people with a lot of education, like maybe they're working too much. Their lives are spent too much around their office. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, um, marriage rates are down and uh, uh, birth rates are down and stuff like that. And so yeah, I, I find it interesting. We go from like, hmm. these everyone works too much. The, we, we're a work obsessed culture. America is like excessively work obsessed. We do something to throw the balance a little bit more in the favor of being at home and spending time with your family. And everyone's like, we got this huge problem where, you know, people aren't spending enough time in their offices with their colleagues. And it's so important. It's like, it's like you can't, it's like you can't win. And I, I personally think throwing the, the, the balance of time towards home life and, you know, your friends and your family and, and your community is probably a healthy thing in this country rather than going sort of in the wrong direction. Got it. Got it. Hey, uh, Ryan, Chris, did you want to push back on anything? He said, I, 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 my sense is you're in rough agreement with uh, Adam's perspective on this. Is there anything that you would push back on? I mean, uh, any or anything that we missed here that you'd, you, you think we should be focused on? I think, no, I think uh, all great points. Uh, the one thing I would point out, I don't know, in, in the Zoom world, um, the, you also have this continuum of work, right? <laughs> the workday yep. never really stops, right? That's the that's the the risk that we face as well. So, 
that might be a, a, a consideration, something that still needs to be addressed in terms of you know, adapting to this uh, world. And I think a hybrid work, I think that's what, where we'll land uh, ultimately mm-hmm. is much more, much more predominant hybrid uh, work, uh, lifestyle, lots of uh, remote work, but still having that, uh, that connection, some, some break up to the, to the day in the weeks uh, to make sure that we have a, a consistent connection with our colleagues. Yeah. yeah one yeah. thing I was w- wondering about is like, do you think this is going to have an impact on climate change? Cause you know, just personally, you know, I've driven my, you know, my one SUV, <laughs> not that much at all this year. Uh, Cause we don't really leave the house that much. So I, I wonder if that's an area for future research is like looking at the, the climate impact of work from home. Yeah, I did a study earlier on in the pandemic. It was like around August where I estimated how much I did a survey asking people what their previous commute was. Like, do you work from home? How long was your previous commute? I sort of calculated up um, uh, what the like uh, cost benefit of this was using like sort of standard estimates of like what's the cost of a uh, vehicle mile travel on you know to your to personal expenses and then social expenses. And I actually found that it, the costs were huge. Like. The average person of their own money is saving like 2000 bucks a year by not commuting. And, um, but the social costs that they were saving were actually higher. So when you, when you include the environment and also congestion costs and the cost of accidents and crashes and lost life, the social costs of driving less that we were saving from working from home outweighed the private. So I definitely think that there's, there's a lot to be gained there. I think we probably will get a little bit of a bounce back from that due to people who are going to be, you know, living like, two or three hours from the office and maybe going in once a month. So it's like less frequent trips, but longer trips. That'll probably call a little bit of that back. But I do think on net, yeah, it's positive for the environment. Hey, talking about work-life balance, it is now 5 p.m. Eastern time, Friday afternoon. So uh, I'm sure everyone's uh, exhausted. I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm a bit tired and I do want to thank you, Adam, for, for joining. And I, you know, I think, uh, when the pandemic hit a year ago, uh, I thought that the longer run impacts of that of the pandemic would be decidedly negative. That there would be what economists said would call a scarring. That you know we'd see a lot of business failure, a lot of people would be thrown out of work permanently. Um, it, it would it would just take us a long, long time to recover from. Uh, the ill effects of the pandemic. And I, and I agree with what you said earlier, Adam. I do think the policy response, uh, the monetary policy response early on, and then the subsequent fiscal policy response, you know, most recently with the American Rescue Plan, has been so massive that it has helped bridge all of us to the other side. You know, there's obviously been a lot of pain and suffering here, you know, healthcare uh, and financial pain and suffering, but we wouldn't even navigated this much, much better than I thought. And then moreover, the pandemic has uh, uh, had impacts that are longer lasting that may actually end up being a positive, a plus. I mean, I can think of a few things like certainly super supercharging our use of uh, of online of the online activities. You know that we were doing that anyway, and that was going to happen. But clearly, the pandemic, put that into hyperdrive and we're in a very different place today than we would have been without the pandemic in terms of online uh, usage and activity. You know, travel, business travel, I think is going to significantly impact the, the way businesses, not so much on the, on the, on the tourism side. It may take a little bit of time just because the pandemic is still raging in the rest of the world and global travel isn't going to kick right back into gear. It may take a few years for that to happen. But business travel, that's not going back to the way it was. And, but, but, at the end of the day, the thing that is the, the, the biggest game changer, and I think for, for the, you know, there's positive and negatives of any change, but on net po- definitively positive is work from anywhere. This is a fundamental shift in the way we live and work. It's going to have all kinds of implications. And I totally agree with the idea that, you know, there's, uh, there's, you know, it's like almost like the internet. It, we all adopted the internet, but those companies that were born after the internet was, you know, in place, they, 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 the, the internet was in their DNA and they could capture the productivity benefits of that. And it was evident in the data. And I sense the same thing happening here. Companies that are born on the other side of this in a work from anywhere kind of environment are just going to be 
light years ahead, and we're going to see you know enormous benefits from this uh, from this dynamic. And I think it's global. I think it's global. I don't think it's. In fact, this may be one of the most significant global unifying unifying forces in the world. You know, at the end of the, I'm, I know it sounds like a little bit hyperbole. I might be getting ahead of myself, and I probably am. But you know, I do think there's a lot to be excited about for this uh, this development. With that, hey Adam, really thank you. You're welcome back anytime. Uh, in fact, I'm going to ask you back regularly. Hopefully, you you will join. Although we have to see the ratings, you know, our <laughs> listeners are important here. So we're going to get the feedback, and you know, if the feedback's good, no, I'm only kidding. I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. But hey, next time we can do it as bowling alley. Yeah, we can do it from his bowling alley. Yeah. Ash, hey. Oh. Yeah, good. Trip. Good. I haven't had pizza. Good pizza in a long time. You have pizza at the bowling alley, or you no pizza? It's a real restaurant there. It's not. Oh, like it's a real alley. restaurant. Okay. Yeah. Adam, over under, Mark and Chris bowling one fifty. Oh. Oh no! I got. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I got to say, I'm under two. <laughs> <laughs> what do you bowl? What is your What is your typical? I am. I am not that great of a bowler, honestly. I'm the. I, I like the arcade games. I'm the. Uh, Ski ball is my game. Okay. Got it. Chris, are you a bowler? No. <laughs> Not at really, all. Really, I'll, I'll, I'll bet you on the on the 150, Brian. I can do 150. Uh, right. you know, of course, I, I'm, a getting, I'm getting a little older, I, you know, as a younger man. I can, I can, <laughs> Is that a dollar bet? Uh, oh, jeez. <laughs> well, bet a slice of pizza. Uh, a slice of pizza. Let's make it a slice of pizza. Yeah. All right. All well, right. thank you very much. Uh, and hey, uh, if you like what you heard, uh, rank us. We need those rankings, so please. Uh, and also questions. By the way, I, last last week I asked you for questions. I got a couple. I'm collecting them. We now have a new email address: inside economics at moody's dot com. Oh, inside economics one word at moody's dot com. Send in your questions, and uh, we will uh, at some point uh, answer those questions. And we've got a lot of swag for those folks that uh, we we take uh, uh, take questions from. So, so thank you very much and uh, talk to you next week.